Welcome to Private Club Radio, the industry's first and only program dedicated to education, news, events, trends and announcements. Broadcasting from Tampa, Florida, ladies and gentlemen, here is your host, Gabriel Aloisi. We've got some Private Club Radio royalty joining us today. Mr. Norm Spitzig of Master Club Advisors returns for an encore appearance. If you are one of the few people that did not hear his episode, episode number 15, I definitely recommend you go back and have a listen. That episode was the most listened to episode in Private Club Radio history, and for very good reason, as Norm shared some golden nuggets with us on that show. And so I'm happy to have Norm back on here once again to give us his insights into club management. On this Encore Show appearance, Norm and I discuss the critical components that great private clubs have. You'll hear Norm's top four ways that private clubs can successfully market themselves. And he's going to round things out with some characteristics that make up a great leader of a private club. This is going to be an episode that you're going to want to download for yourself and keep on hand. Hey, burn a CD of it, whatever you got to do. I won't get on you for copyright infringement. Burn a CD, share it with your friends. I am all for that. This content is too good, just too good. Before we bring Norm on, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you haven't heard, Private Club Radio last week released our mobile application. We now have a mobile app that you can download for your iPhone or Android phone. It'll be an icon sitting right there on your phone. It'll make it so much more easy to listen to episodes each and every Monday. In addition, you can vote for your favorite episode. You can register for one of the webinars. There's lots to be had on that app. You can check out every single guest we've had here on Private Club Radio. Listen to the back catalog. Definitely recommend you download that. Go to the iTunes store or the Google Play store and just simply search for Private Club Radio will come right up and you can download that app onto your mobile device. One other little piece of news, actually some big news personally, I'm thrilled to announce that after nearly seven years of serving our clients, private clubs all across the country, Shake Creative, my agency, has taken the next step in its evolution. This week, we unveiled our new name and our new brand, the Private Club Agency. We went back to the drawing board with our services to really figure out what private clubs needed in terms of their design, marketing, and consulting needs. And we retooled our offerings, and we've really doubled down on our mission to help private clubs attract and retain more members. I invite you to check out our new website, privateclubagency.com. It's now time to bring on our featured guest, Norm Spitzig. Norm currently serves as principal and senior partner in Master Club Advisors. MCA is the publisher of the premier newsletter for leaders in the worldwide private club industry, Club Management Perspectives, and it's now regarded by more and more leaders in the private club industry as a general manager executive search firm of choice. Norm's board of directors leadership orientation and strategic planning sessions have been well received nationally and internationally at many of the professional associations, as well as great individual private clubs on six continents. Norm has been elected a national director of the CMAA. He has served as national president back in 1995, and he was one of the six original general managers to earn the prestigious lifetime master club manager distinction. He has the singular honor of having been twice named the club industry's educator of the year. We are thrilled to have Norm back on the show once again. Norm, welcome. Gabe, I am so happy to be here. It's really an honor, and uh, the first time was a lot of fun, and I think uh, I resonated with a few people because I got lots of uh, good response, so I'm happy to be back. You sure did. I think your episode was the number one listened to episode in private club history to date, so we're really excited to have you. Now, Norm, the last time we had you on the program, we were discussing some of the critical components of great private clubs. So to remind listeners, those were number one, having a set of reasonable rules that are understandable and fairly enforced. And secondly, the club's role as a safe haven 
in this chaotic world, which has got even more chaotic since we last spoke with all, everything that's going on in France and Orlando and all these things. What are some other key components that you've recognized, Norm? And can you tell us about them? Uh, thanks. I, I will. Um, that, just to refresh some people or maybe perhaps those who didn't listen to it, for me, it was always a labor of love trying to understand what really made a private club great. I've worked with dozens and dozens of clubs, helping them focus and understand who they are. And uh, if you have a strategic plan, I am convinced that you will have a lot of benefits to your club, financial, social, and everything. Um, a strategic plan is pretty simple. First off, what what is it? Well, I, I think it's just a systematic program for thoughtful, controlled change at your club over a period of time, typically three to five years. If you get beyond five years, it becomes sort of hypothetical speculation and you don't know what's going on. If you're just going to talk about a year, well, that's just your, your annual budget. So I think if you, you kind of think, what is this club going to be in the next three to five years? How are we going to get there? And much more importantly, a part that people forget to talk about is how are we going to evaluate whether or not we've been successful in achieving our goals? That's pretty straightforward what a plan is. What's included, pretty simple again, um, a mission statement, and that's just a simple statement of what the club is. I've worked with all kinds of clubs on this, and some have a more traditional approach that, you know, we are a family private club offering golf tennis, you know, in a in a warm and safe environment, and that's good. And I've worked with some clubs where they said, we're a fun place to be. That was really what their sure. mission was. I, I kind of I like that. Yeah. You know, and each one reflects sort of the nuance of what the club's about. Uh, in addition to a mission, a club is typically has a vision statement, which is a statement of um, uh, agreeing um, principles that, that basically guide where the club's going to be. You know, typically a vision statement would include something like, we're going to have a full membership complement by January 1, 2018. Well, that's really great. The real question is, how do we go about doing that? And, and if you have the plan, it's really important that we really dig down, come up with some strategies that really make sense for achieving those. And then the third part is the clubs have these core values. And core values are really straightforward. It's a statement of what you believe is important and rules that which you're never going to vary. Um, as an example, almost all clubs say we want to operate in a financially sound manner and, and agree to um, being in uh, value integrity in everything we do. So really straightforward. I think what, what happens is when you have the plan, it is a really great way for bringing your entire membership together and say, look, this is what we are in the next three to five years. And as a result of that, here are the things that we're going to do. If your club says, for instance, that we are really family focused, family oriented, then you better put your dollars towards achieving that goal in the next three to five years. You don't want to say you're family focused and then not allow anybody under 14 on the golf course unless it's raining or snowing on a Tuesday in January. And honestly, I worked with a club one time who I will not name who said that they were a family oriented club. They believed they were a family oriented club. And when we took a, large, uh, a hard look at all their rules, they were, I guess, genuinely surprised that the rules prohibited families from doing all kinds of things. So what happens is, is that when you say something, you go back and you look at all your rules, your policies, your procedures, what you really do, and make sure that they in turn correspond with who you are. So pr pretty straightforward here. A strategic plan really is, uh, besides the systematic thought, it's not a budget. Uh, it's not a business plan. It's not a, an annual budget. It's not a marketing plan. All those are typically parts of a strategic plan. Um, what what can a plan do for a club where there's all kinds of great things? Being? I think, as I said, first of all, it'll make sure that you have member-focused change, not this random change where you get one crazy director to decide that we're going to, I don't know, build a $3 million swimming pool and nobody else at the club even wants a swimming pool. Um, typically, not that typically is too strong, but you know as well as I do that there are clubs where you get one or two people who get on the board with an agenda. Unfortunately, that's the way of the world. And a strategic plan is a great way for keeping that kind of situation at bay, where if we all know that we're going in direction A, when we get somebody new whose only purpose of being on there is to, I don't know, redo all the bunkers when the bunkers were just redone five years ago, it doesn't make sense. It's a good way for controlling this sort of vocal minority. Um, I think it provides targets for management. You know, if I know that we're going to be have a full membership or trying to have a full membership, say in three years, and we have a, st a strategy to do that, you know, as a manager, I'm pretty excited. Uh, we, we really want to get here. We want to do what we can to get new members. I'm actually working with a club in South Florida, Florida right now where 
their primary focus is, is that they've got a great operation, they're financially sound, they could use another 100 net increase in members. Uh, the facilities would take it, they want it, and we're really working on some, I think, pretty innovative strategies to allow them to get some new members. So that's really high in their important in there. As I said, it provides a, a roadblock to these road directors, which happen, and it really allows the club to manage their financial commitments and prioritize them. You know, if, again, if your strategic plan says that we're going to be family focused, then it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense, in my opinion, to put dollars to renovating the golf course for the seventh time in nine years. Right. That's going to really return anything. And, you know, it's interesting how clubs do that. So for me, I think it, I, I found that I work with clubs, those who have a strategic plan, generally speaking, have a culture of success on their board. They have a, they have a better understanding of the needs of the membership. Honestly, it's easier for the general manager and the staff to understand where the club is going and, and all things considered, it just really makes sense. So great clubs in summary, I think have a great strategic plan. Yeah. I, I love what you said there about core values, because for me, it really helps give staff and management a framework for how to behave or how to react when these challenges arise as well. So it's really important to have that as a, as, as a system in place in your club. I love that. Um, if, you know, of course, if a core value says, for instance, that we are going to value the staff and a lot of clubs put that in and they really say it and they mean it. That, that reminds the board on those occasions, which are typically rare in a club, where somebody gets out of hand and does something they shouldn't do towards the staff, it reminds the board, you've got to take action. You just can't throw your hands up because he's your buddy or works in the same law firm with you. This person did something that's inappropriate and we've got to take action. So thank you. I like that. Yeah, that's right. It holds everyone to a particular standard. And I think that's very important, especially you'd have that cohesiveness. Yep. Um, now, I know you mm-hmm. know that great clubs, I, you say, are permeated by traditions. Can you explain that for us, Norm? Uh, sure. Another characteristic of great clubs. And, and first, let me say, you know, traditions really are, uh, I think, in the club world, uh, what are the customs, and values, ceremonies, rituals, procedures, whatever you want to say that clubs typically do year after year and hopefully generation after generation. Um, with that as kind of an understanding, I have seen a fair number of clubs use tradition as an excuse for ineptitude on their part or they're just unwillingness to change. They'll say it's traditional that uh, we don't allow cell phones in the clubhouse. Well, that's really not much of an issue anymore. But five years ago, it was a giant issue, and people argued about it 10 years ago. That's an excuse for failing to keep up with the times, and it's, I think it's an excuse for failing to understand what's going on. The clubs that have traditions, I like when I go to my club, and I know every year that uh, Santa Claus is going to arrive by helicopter. When I was at Fort Wayne Country Club, that was something that people loved and looked forward to. That on the right outside the clubhouse and in front of the 18th Green, Santa came every year with a big helicopter, and it was a big to do. You know, we had 500 or 1,000 people there. And is, does it make the club better or worse? No, but it sure brought a lot of people out when it came across the ride. <laughs> sure. So those are the kind of just one little example. Um, or, you know, we have a tradition. I know another club where they have a tradition where the board once a year have a carnival. It's a beach club and the board actually goes out and uh, lets the members and staff take a shot at them when they sit in the dunk tank. I mean, you see some, some you have a bus boy trying to knock the president in the water. That's pretty cool. You know, so <laughs> yeah. a club that would do that. Now, again, you can laugh at it and the traditions are these kind of things that hold the club together, you know, and, and as the club, one of the things that's really challenging, especially for clubs here in Florida is when they're relatively new and you get people coming from literally from the Midwest and New York and you know all over the South and they come and they, they each bring different traditions. So it takes a while for that club to kind of evolve and perk the things that value that everybody values to percolate to the top. Mm-hmm. Anyway, traditions make the club fun and make it interesting. And, you know, the clubs that my wife and I belong to have, you know, several little traditions that, that are great. And it's just another characteristic of, what really makes a club valuable and in, in turn what makes it really great. That sounds like a club I'd like to belong to where I can dunk the GM. <laughs> that's how, yeah, that's yeah or dunk the president. How would you like a bus boy who's going to dunk this president? <laughs> baby? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Norm, as you know, I'm a marketing guy, so I'm always interested in finding ways to successfully market private clubs and find new members. You've got a list yep. of the top four ways that successful clubs should be marketing. Can you tell us what those are and break them down for us? 
Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, as I said, I've had the good fortune to travel around the world and see a lot of clubs and meet with a lot of boards and do a lot of things. And, and I'm always interested in trying to understand what clubs are successful in attracting and maintaining new members and what other clubs are just kind of spinning their wheels and saying they're doing the right thing. And it, it seems to me that you can kind of distill all the variations of the plans that are going on in, under four sort of major categories. Now, that's great. You have the categories, but, but I'll try to give you some drill down examples to what clubs have done. The first thing that seems to work particularly well at the clubs that keep members or what I would call personal member-to-member invitations. There's nothing wrong with having a marketing director who's going to follow up, but the clubs that I think really get the members is when somebody calls up and says, hey, Norm, you and your wife just moved to Mount Dora, Florida. You need to join the Mount Dora Lawn uh, Bulls Club. And okay, tell me more about it. I didn't know anything about Lawn Bulls, but what happens? We get invited to join the Mount Dora Lawn Bulls Club by somebody who's a regular at my wife's restaurant, and you know the rest is history. So it's these personal member-to-member invitations. Now, with that sort of broad category, you still have to understand and think about how do you do that? Um, At our symposium, HR symposium, we had somebody talk about millennials and what really resonates with millennials. And I know that's a generalization, but he said something which I think is true. Millennials communicate by text, email, social media. When is the last time a millennial actually called up and said, I'd like to join your club? You know, <laughs> give me information about your club. They're not going to do that. My three kids are all in their 30s. They wouldn't think of calling up. Right. So if you're going to have member to member invitations, you got to figure out how to you know, invite them. And one lady said that potential members, they send text messages to. Your name came to me. I'm so-and-so, the, the marketing director. I heard you might be interested in joining the club. You'd be surprised how many people under 40 said, hmm, this is kind of cool. Let me look at it. So member-to-member invitations doesn't mean literally I'm going to call you all the time. It means I'm going to figure out my target audience. Okay. Uh, the second thing is I think you know clubs that are successful have pictures and testimonials on their website of people having a good time. Furthermore, the testimonials are believable, not just – I don't know. This club is the greatest club since sliced bread and in the history of the free world. Well, you know, everybody knows that's just sort of silly. But if you have a picture of a family having fun at a private party or people swimming and, you know, at the pool and just really enjoying themselves, you think, hmm, this, these people are having a good time. I think I might want to join that club. The clubs that, that post pictures of younger people having a good time in their hallway in addition to, or even as opposed to, like this rogues gallery of past presidents, you know, Irving Schmutlegel, from, who was president from <laughs> 1941 to 1943. He right. might have been a great guy, yeah. and his, his parents may be interested, but that's not going to make me want to join. I want to see people having fun. So the more testimonials I get, the more clubs seem to be successful. I've seen this particularly um, used in, in Asia. A lot of the clubs really promote in, in Australia, too. Uh, the third sort of topic is not every club can certainly be exclusive. We're not, we're not all, you know, not a club with a lengthy waiting list where we go through all this elaborate screening to get you in. And that's fine. There are a lot of clubs that do that, but any, what did Groucho Marx say? Say, I don't want to join any club that would let me be a member. There's something that really resonates with humanity about that, that if I can join this club anytime and there's actually no barriers to membership, be they financial or, some sort of screening or something, I'm, I'm not going to go. And even if the screening process is, you know, just a formality, people want to belong to a club where not everybody in the world can get in all the time. So it's a fine line. You want to be exclusive and exclusive doesn't mean you're keeping anybody out. It just means that, you know, we have this core value. Here's who we are. And our club is for those people who understand and appreciate these core values, this mission, our strategic plan, and all that kind of stuff. There's something psychological the there, too. I, I just want to mention there's there's something psychological mm-hmm. there about exclusivity that's so very important. It's it's so important to a brand that nobody wants to to just get what they can get easily. People want something they can strive for. It's really interesting, but that's how brands like Rolex, that's Mercedes, the best brands you could think of, that's how they work. There has to be some air of exclusivity. It doesn't necessarily even need to be monetary. It could be something else, but uh, that's a really important point you make there. I just wanted to make sure we highlight that. Well, thank you. I, I, th- I think that's right. And you it's a perfect segue what you said into what I think is sort of the fourth 
30,000 foot way that clubs get new members is that they understand really what their brand is and they stick with it. If their brand is that we're going to attract people in our, in their sixties who are at the pre-retirement age coming to Florida, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. There's actually a club in the greater Tampa area that I won't uh, say in the Sarasota area, I won't say the name. You may figure it out that they thought their target market when I worked with them a few years ago was to attract these pre-retirement people. The average age of this club was about 75 at the time, or maybe pushing 80. So younger members for them were people who were 60. That was their target. If your target is you want to get millennials, then you better really make sure you understand, you know, the generality of what millennials do, that they, what I'm trying to think of some of the things I learned. 33% of the millennials thought it was okay to text during a job interview. I would be aghast at that. But that's what they said. Oh 43% gosh. of them said that, that, that they would like weekly feedback from their boss. And if they don't get weekly feedback from their boss, uh, you know, they're, they're not going to be working at that place anymore. Wow. Their first wow. job was age 27. And anyway, I went down all these things. I wrote down a film, <laughs> which is really amazing. Sure. But if your target market is new, younger members, you better understand how to appeal to them, what resonates with them. We'll talk later on, I hope, about golf because there's some things that really resonate with millennials about golf. And, um, you know, if you really want to increase your golf market, you better do what, the, what they want. Anyway, those four things, understanding the brand, uh, have this aura of exclusivity, these positive, believable testimonials and everything that you do, and these personal invitations that fit your club culture. If you kind of use those as overarching principles, and then under each one list five or six or seven or whatever number of things you can come up with that fit your club culture, I think you're going to be much more focused and successful by getting new members. Awesome stuff, Norm. I totally agree with each one of those. Um, this, the testimonials also, I think is, I just want to highlight that, what you said there. I, whenever I work with a new club doing their social media or something like that, one of the main things okay. I tell them, instead of just posting, you know, specials or, you know, your summer membership offer, post testimonials of, of, of what real members at your club are doing and how they're enjoying the club, because that's, that's, that social proof is so integral, especially like you said, to millennials, they want to make sure that they are interacting with a brand that, that actually cares about them and, and, and that cares about people. And so that really good stuff there. Well, thank you. It makes me feel good that we're on the same page because you're the pro. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's good. I mean, you've been in the business a lot longer than myself, but, uh, yeah, I, I'm glad. I'm glad we are. Well, let's segue into leadership. Let's talk about uh, leadership in the private club industry. Last time we had you on, we talked about being a great communicator as well as a great listener. We did. What other characteristics would you say make a great leader of a private club, Norm? Well, we talked about that, and I think what was really interesting um, for those who don't didn't listen or remember that that three different studies by three different people in different decades all corroborated in the private club industry that being a good communicator slash listener was the number one criteria of success in the private club world uh, in terms of, of um, having a core characteristic of being a great leader. I think it was pretty cool. This is really just to communicate. What I have sort of discovered of late is a, I think, a s- simple and useful way for looking at leadership in the private club world. And I've used it in some of my talks and it, it, it may, may help people. Um, I think leadership, if you look at it this way in the private club, it's balancing the task that you have at hand with the relationship that you must keep. Think about the task that you have and the relationship you must keep. So in each one, we're going to, sometimes the relationship is low or high and sometimes the task is low or high. Let me give you some examples in the club world. Let's take something that has, where the relationship isn't all that important and the task you deem it not to be very important. I would give you an example of that in the club world that someone asked you to be co-chair of the pickle committee. I'm, I'm thinking of something crazy. Um, the relationship's not important. The task's not important. And we get that a lot in our lives. Maybe you do. I get people ask me to do things where I'm not really good friends with somebody. I don't want to alienate anybody, but it's not, the relationship's not all that important. And the task itself, I deem something I don't really want to do. Well, if that's the case, those are the kind of things you really want to avoid. So good leaders just avoid those. We have a certain amount of time. Let's just not deal with them. Take something where the relationship is not all that important or secondary. It's important, obviously, in, in all cases, but it, it's not the driver. But the task, getting the job done is really important. In the club world, let's say you're in the process of serving a banquet of 500 people right now. You're serving the food out, and you notice that a couple of the waitresses are doing things 
wrong. I don't know. They're, they're, they're serving from the wrong side of the table. They're standing. They're not working hard. Things that you would notice. If I was running that banquet, I, I'd make a mental note of it. But right now, the task is really, really important. I've got to serve 500 people. I am not going to pull the people aside and correct them. You know, outside the club industry, a perfect example is an emergency room doctor, one of the groups of people who generally are not liked by their coworkers. If I'm hit by a car later today and they take me to the emergency room, I re- I do not want a doctor who wants to chat me up for half an hour, ask me how I'm feeling, how's my life, and finances okay, how the stock market do today. No, I want him to look at me and fix me now. I don't I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> so in that case, sometimes the task is really really important. It overweighs the at least temporarily the relationship. In the club world, uh, I gave you an example. The third one was would be when the task is not all that important, but the relationship is really, really important. Oh, what would be a good example? My wife says we need to go to dinner on Saturday night uh, at this particular group she belongs to. Okay, I've been married 34 years. The relationship is real, real important. Do I want to go and miss, I don't know, what would be on Saturday night? Probably, for example, some sporting event on Masters weekend. She wants me to go and miss the <laughs> oh, last gosh. round of the Masters. Right, right. Uh, yeah, we might actually have that talk. <laughs> that's <pretty laughs> important, but that's sure. pretty drastic. Forgetting the Masters, just something I wanted to watch, the Olympics or whatever. I probably would record it uh, because the relationship's much more important. In other words, when for, to be a good leader, the job there is to accommodate. And of course, the last one where the task is important and the relationship is important. Now, that's something you want to spend your time on. You know, you want to spend your time on it. And that's a good example of an energized, engaged board. And and when I do this with boards, we give some examples and have an exercise or two to show that if we really think the task is important, like let's develop a strategic plan, and we think the relationship with our members is important, how can we use this plan to communicate what we're doing and attract and retain more members? Or we're on the same page. We're collaborating like crazy. And when you set that stage, boards get really energized and they actually work. So I, I like that model. I heard that about four or five years ago uh, from some academic, and I really like it. So anyway, it's a good model that works in the club. It works in your personal life. You know, I, people I can take it. it for what it's worth. Yeah, I love that advice. That's fantastic advice. Thanks. Norm, after a lifetime in this industry, you've heard a lot of other advice, I'm sure, and you've gleaned some wisdom. Can you give us a few of your top uh, quotes from some of the industry leaders? Oh boy. Thank you. I will. Um, I think I'm one of those people who's always writing down notes. If if I hear something that's really good, I'm, I'm at the HR symposium and I was taking notes from different speakers, as you heard me refer to about sort of what millennials want. I'm always trying to learn. And here are four or five quotes that really resonate with me. And I think they're clever and witty, but much more importantly, they have a lesson and it's a life lesson that we can talk about. So Here's one from a guy named John McCraney. John is the GM at the Cat Key Yacht Club in the Bahamas. John's a friend of mine. He's my placement there about four years ago. And it's a club that I go to regularly and help them with with their strategic plan. John tells his staff this, never forget the vital importance of having one's club staff understand the difference between their function at the club and their role at the club. As an example, you ask a guy in the dishwasher, what's your function at the club? Your function is to wash dishes. You have a good guy on the golf course. What's your function at the club? It might be to edge bunkers. It might be to mow fairways or greens or put down fertilizer or whatever. That's their function. But what's their role at the club? Their role is to make the members happy. So if you remember that my main role is to make the members happy, then, you know, if I'm uh, taking the trash out and I'm a dishwasher and somebody comes in the back and I wave to them, I make them feel pretty good. Or I'm on the golf course and I got to get this task done if I got to mow the greens, but somebody's coming up and hitting balls, I'm going to stop and turn my engine down and wave. If you really remember that your role is, if it is to make members happy, which I think is sort of a core role in every club, then it changes your whole outlook. It empowers staff to do the right thing. Uh, it empowers staff to put their task aside for the moment and make the member happy. And, you know, if you open the door for a member or you wave to him with the front door and you just happen to be out there, well, you made that member stay. So I like John's quote. Yeah. Um, Ken Brown is a past president of the national club of the, excuse me, CMAA national club association, club managers association of America, a friend of mine for 30 years. And Ken is a real financial guy. He gets that you can be the best at what you do and make people happy. But if you don't meet the bottom line, you know, you're probably not going to be around a long time. Ken said this, if you beat the budget, your enemy cannot harm you. If you don't, your friends cannot save you. I just love that. I think it really uh, reinforces the importance 
of you you got to be all these great things to all people. you got to be outgoing and happy and understand all the things that make people happy in the club world. But you also got to run a business. Yeah. If you're running a, an $80 million business like Ocean Reef where we're going this weekend, or you're running a little club of $5 million, you know, if you have $5 million of income and you have $7 million of expenses this year, you can be the nicest guy in the world and you will not be at that club too long. You mm-hmm. just will not. And Ken was really good about that. Uh, our third quote, this has not from the club industry, but I've used it a, uh, a lot, is Yogi Berra. Everybody knows Yogi Berra, just a great hitter. He actually belonged to the Montclair Golf Club in New Jersey. And I actually, when I was doing a board orientation there several years ago, he actually said, uh, I heard somebody's quoting me, and he came into the meeting and, and introduced himself. It's pretty nice. cool. Nice, yeah. But Yogi, yeah, Yogi said, the secret of being a good manager is to keep the people who uh, who hate you away from those who are still undecided. <laughs> and, and it's just really a great Yogi quote. Yeah. That you can be the best manager in the world and there are still going to be people who don't like you. They don't like you because I'm too tall, too short, because I'm too fair skinned, because my hair is the wrong color, because they think I snubbed their wife seven years ago when I passed them in the hallway <laughs> and didn't smile. It could be anything. Right. And, and it, it's just a great quote. Do you have any tips uh, for like one... developing a, a thicker skin norm or anything? Uh, yeah, you know, they always tell you, don't take it personally. I think the irony of that is most club managers take it personally every day because we're in a hospitality business and we want people to be happy all the time and you just can't do it. Right. You know, I've, I, what I've learned though is that you can, no matter what club you belong to, there's a small core of people who one, two, three percent, whatever it is, are just mad that the sun came up in the east today. They were rooting <laughs> for the west, you know, or or they're only happy when they're unhappy. There's just people like that, sure. and you you need to go home and tell yourself, you know, you, you don't want to bring you home. When I came home, you know, my wife's a good person and outgoing and friendly, and she was really pretty good. And, you know, leave leave that stuff at work; it'll be there tomorrow morning. So, right. you know, you you, you got to do it. Good stuff. Maybe maybe one more quote that I that I really like is a friend of mine named Michelle Goswami who runs Frenchman's Creek over in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, down in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. Michelle uh, has been there twenty years. I guess the best thing to say about Michelle is that they did a survey of the club many years ago. 10 years ago and they asked everybody to rate the general manager and of everybody who responded hundreds and hundreds of people with five being you know he walks on water and one means being we should shoot him he got all fives all fives except one four and the board was irate they wanted to track down and you know draw and quarter the one person that they had to ask to give him a four right. that's how much he's like oh my anyway goodness. his quote his quote is sacred cows make the best burgers <laughs> great gr- great way of saying that you know every club you go to you got these people especially you're new who is a sacred cow and think that they're above the rules invincible several people in politics come to mind but i'm not going to bring those up now <laughs> but some people think they're above the rules and you know the staff knows that they're getting away with things the staff is evaluating you to see if you're going to continue to let them get away for things and you, you just can't have these sacred cows they just bring everything down and you know as i said you know those are just four of my favorites but there are lots and they just they make a smile on my face bring to my face they're also a good way of oh making your point in a way that people will remember people if you say give me the seven principles of excellent service and you can drill your staff if you i used to do that all the time and and you, you would list these things and they would forget but if you make a game of it and help people remember and say if you for everyone you remember i'll give you two bucks or something in your shaft training people are going to know the principles sure gotta make it fun so anyway those are a few i hope make people smile i'd love to see some of those like in poster form like those 90s motivational posters Mm -hmm. and those make some really good ones right there (laughs) yeah i think i think they would yeah (laughs) well norm in your opinion is golf dying or is it just evolving uh, dying is too strong. It's, it's dr- melodramatic, overreacting. It's evolving, and it's evolving in a way that happens in every generation. The history of the world is about people who get old, who don't like change anymore, and new younger people coming in who want change. It happens in politics. It happens in life. It happens in, in private clubs. And I think private clubs are it's probably exacerbated because you get some people who get really set in their ways. They have some control. They, they no longer work maybe, or they don't have control of their work. So they really, they really want to fight to the death in private clubs. I think golf really is evolving in a way that is making it more fun, 
uh, more enjoyable, that we can still have traditional golf. You know, when I play in a member guest, I want to follow the rules. I will not roll my ball over. I just, that's who I am. I'm not going to do that. And if I shoot a hundred, so be it. But when, when I was young and I went out with my kids, the rule was really simple. I drove the ball wherever I hit it to. All three of my kids got to drop a ball from there and we hit it in. Is that real golf? No, but they were eight, nine, and 12, and they got to enjoy the game of golf. Right. So I think it's really evolving to something being more fun. I brought back, when Greg Patterson and I were in Australia, in New Zealand this past May and June, there were a lot of clubs there that I thought were really on the cutting edge about understanding the golf uh, to appeal to millennials, especially, but the appeal to everybody it needs to be more casual, laid back, and fun. And um, here, let me read a couple of these the, the brochures they handed out. This one's called "Share the Course" from Moore Park Golf Club, in I think it was in Sydney. It was really pretty cool. But their rules. Let me find this here. Oh, pace of play. This is a golf course, not a doctor's surgery. Don't wait for your turn. If you're ready and it's safe, take your shot. Mm-hmm. Yep. When's the last time? When, when did you? When's the last time a long distance relationship ever worked? Make sure you keep up with the group in front of you. <laughs> they say practice. They say practice makes perf, uh, perfect, and that's right. That's why we have a driving range. Keep your practice swings to a minimum. Um, I think those are kind of clever and a nice way of reminding people that we don't need to play like the PGA Tour guys do on Sunday afternoon. We can go out and have fun. I mean, I I love it in the winter when in Florida, when a lot of the, the, excuse me, in the summer, when a lot of the snowbirds go away and the courses actually, they're not quite as crowded and they're desperate. I can go out with my kids and we can each get a cart and we can play golf in two and a half hours and not rush. And oh, have those fun. are the best ones. So yeah. they, they really are. Uh, another one of the clubs they have is their guiding motto. Be respectful of history and excuse me, of the history of golf, but don't be bound by it. So that means to be open to what people are doing. If you want to have a Six inch cup for a tournament, that's great. You want to put three bunkers, you know, you know, or excuse me, three cups on the green for a particular junior tournament, do it. There's a club in in uh, North Carolina where they have a thing called uh, wine, women and wine, and they play three holes of golf and then they drink wine. Now, the purpose, the purpose of that is to introduce people to golf. Golf is intimidating and hard and you know, the rule book of golf isn't big, but you've seen the interpretation of the rules. I mean, it's bigger than an old phone book. Yep. People get all in out of shape about that. Um, this other club, their motto for golf was women want fashion, fun, and femininity. I just love that. Mm-hmm. When women play golf, they want to be fashionable. They want to have fun, and they want to be feminine. So I think it's a really pretty good um, indication of where golf is going. Yes, it's changing. Yes, we will still have the formal PGA and the and the um, uh, you know all people who play strictly by the rules for the tournament. I found I don't know what you think about this, but I really enjoyed watching the um, the golf in the Olympics. I was kind of hesitant. I thought maybe nobody interested, but I thought what was really neat is some of the anecdotal things that they played on TV. Like one person, I heard they overheard one person say he hit the ball into the sandbox because he didn't know it was called a bunker. <laughs> right. or yeah, but, right. But he was there. He yeah. was there. It was pretty cool. Hey. It was pretty cool. Yeah. You know, you live in a part of the world. Isn't there a, a top golf in the t- in Tampa? Yeah, it's in Brandon, just outside Tampa. Yeah, well, there's an example of a place where even if you're not a golfer, I've been once, even if you're not a golfer, you can have a drink, have hors d'oeuvres, hit your own customized ball, and wherever you want to aim, you can just hit it off the top or try to hit it 300 yards. They don't care. You can bring your own clubs. Don't bring your own clubs. Right. Uh, they just kind of introduce you to the fact that this game, which looks difficult, doesn't necessarily have to be all that difficult. So yeah. I think all these trends to – make golf more human and appealing and less complex are good ones. And I think the, 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 the next 10 years will be a time where we balance the traditional role of golf, which will never go away. The traditions of the game with this whole nother generation who doesn't have four and a half hours to play golf plus an hour and a half before to go to the club and have lunch plus two hours afterwards <laughs> to, you know, have a drink with their buddies and kill a whole day. Pe- people don't do that anymore. Yeah, so exactly. yeah, I'm, I'm an optimist. I really am. I think golf's just doing the right thing. I just think it's like everything when it's new, you know, old border, old boards and just generally old people get nervous about change. You know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
a couple things there that I, w- I just want to note. Um, I totally agree with like, you know, gamifying the practice facilities. So why not have a target out there on your driving range where, you, you know, someone hits it in there, you know, and you do that over the course of a month and draw, draw a name out of a hat from, from people that do that. Or why not have a little sure. chipping contest at your, uh, you know, or things that you do before these, these tournaments, right? It's why do we, why does it have to be just during a tournament where you have a putting contest? You could do that, you know, in a, every month or so. Uh, I, I, any way you can make the game a little bit more approachable, break it down, um, and get people practicing it, then they're going to be a lot more comfortable to actually play an 18 hole round when it comes to th- that time. So totally agree with that. Yeah, you're exactly right. One, one club that I just remember in, uh, Australia, and I can't remember the club, but I wrote down what their mission was when it came to golf. It says our focus is on entertainment with golf being the vehicle for that particular entertainment. Oh, love that. that is a great, great way of telling your staff. We want that. people to have a good time. Golf is the vehicle we're using to have them a good time. So yeah. I, I really like that's, that. That's right on. Um, I, yeah, it is. It really is. Thank you. Anything stand out in New Zealand? Was there a particular course or anything that uh, someone's got to play? Get oh, out there? there is. There is. There is. We finished our last talk in Auckland on a Saturday, maybe on a Friday, and we were scheduled to go home on Monday. So uh, Greg and I and Mike Orloff, who's um, a golf professional in that part of the world, a good friend of ours and our tour guide, uh, we all said, where can we play? I knew a guy named Matt Guzik, good friend of mine for a long time, ran a club in in, uh, Montana. He and his wife are now the GM and and resident managers of a place called Terra Iti, T-A-R-A-I-T-I. Terra Iti is 90 minutes north of Auckland. It is a Tom Doak um, sort of Lynx course. It's fantastic. When we played, I believe there was one other group that had the audacity to tee off like a half an hour ahead of us or something. How dare they? Nobody on. Yeah, how dare they? There, there was nobody on the course. It was well. Here we're talking about golf being fun. It was super for me. We had a caddy. Mm -hmm. You got to walk. The weather was sixty-five degrees and sunny. Yeah, low humidity. It was just really nice and. Um, they, he was saying that, you know, they could probably fill this club up tomorrow, but they're being careful about trying to attract the, the, the right mix of people who, you know, appreciate golf and they, they, they want to have some Kiwis, but they, they're trying to have some internationals from, uh, Australia also, and some from China and some from the U S and it's just a fantastic property. It really was. Um, I'd love to go back. I really would. <laughs> I looked at a couple pictures. Up Plus, the I, line bur- I birdied the fourth hole. There I birdied. I remember I birdied the fourth. That never happened. So that, that was good. <laughs> I just saw some pictures. I just popped it up online. It looks <laughs> beautiful. I definitely recommend listeners take a look at Terra E.T. It looks incredible. Yeah, uh, yeah it really was. Norm, how do folks find out more about you, get in touch, or start to work with Master Club Advisors? Uh, yeah, sure. Master Club Advisors has been around 15, 16 years. Uh, we started with this humble idea of giving back to the club industry, and we've expanded into all the topics I've talked about, general manager search, board orientation, talks, and all that. Uh, Master Club Advisors with an S dot com, and you can find everything about who we are. Um, you can follow me on LinkedIn. I have a fair number of people who I'm connected with on LinkedIn, and uh, you can see about some of the clubs I've worked with and in more detail some of the things that we've done. So uh, for me, is I think I told the first we were talking in the first uh, conversation together. It's always been a labor of love. I'm lucky enough to work for a really good mentor when I was a young guy, got me enthused and fired up about the club business. And it's something that, you know, even at this uh, aging state of my life, I really enjoy working with clubs and it kind of puts a little bounce in my step when you, you know, kind of turn a club around or point them in the right direction or find the right club manager for, for them or whatever. So feel free to give me a call. My, all my, cell phone numbers and emails are on those two websites. Norm, fantastic as always. Really enjoyed the insights you gave uh, t- to us today. So so much appreciation for uh, what you're doing for the industry. Thanks so much for being on today. Well, thank you, Gabe. It was a pleasure. Thanks. You have a great day. Bye-bye. That's a gentleman that when he talks, you definitely want to listen. I hope you enjoyed that just as much as I did. And I hope you come back and join us again next week here on Private Club Radio. Until then, here's to your membership success. Just because this round is over doesn't mean you can't enjoy the 19th hole. Check out privateclubradio.com for more. Private Club Radio is brought to you by Shake Creative, the premier marketing and design firm helping prestigious clubs increase and retain their membership. 
Visit shaketampa.com to learn more. Why do over 60% of boardroom magazines' distinguished clubs choose to partner with Club Essential? The better question is, why not? As the leading provider of club management and marketing software to over 1,400 private clubs, our unified suite of modules are designed to automate club operations while informing and engaging members. From websites to accounting and POS to CRM, online reservations, and mobile apps, Club Essential has all of your club's technology needs covered. Visit clubessential.com to learn how our experienced team can help your club. Again, that's clubessential.com. Hello there. I have a question for you. How impressed are members with the cleanliness of your club? To attract new members and keep current ones happy, your club must provide the best cleaning and maintenance service possible. Elegance Cleaning Service specializes in country club cleaning. We'll create a custom cleaning program where members can see and actually feel the difference. Don't accept par for the course at your club. Visit clubelegance.net and step up your cleaning game today.